Thank you, Doug. This morning, if you've got your Bibles, please be turning to Luke chapter 17. Before we get there, I wanted to throw out a word, uh, an announcement for an upcoming parenting class on Passing on Faith. The title of this class is called Sticky Faith. We want our kids to catch hold of and our faith that we pass on, the faith in Jesus Christ, to stick to them. So beginning Wednesday, March 9th, that's this upcoming Wednesday night, you see stuck there, I don't think, that may be photoshopped in, uh, Will Spoon, Mike Johns, Kevin Peters, youth ministers, children's ministers, extraordinaires, uh, parents, please mark that on your calendars beginning this coming Wednesday night. Kids, Kids Connection is on right now. So praise the Lord, parents. Kids Connection, if you need, okay, so be mindful of that as well. Um, Hey, let me also this morning, uh, I have figured out what you could ask any first grader, and they would know. Uh, Siri also knows the answer to this question of what does it take to solve a difficult maze? And so I asked this question of, of Siri, of the Internet. Uh, how do you solve a difficult maze? Go ahead and bring up that picture. This was the answer. In the red arrow, it says, start here. Start at the finish. Any first grader, in fact, any of us, if you really want to knock out a difficult maze quickly, you start at the end and work towards the beginning. Sticky faith, our faith, our walk in Christ is very similar to this. We live our lives with the end in mind. In fact, many times it behooves us to live out our days, beginning our days, thinking about where we will spend most of our days with Jesus Christ one day. And so because of that, today I want to ask this question as we return again to Luke chapter 17. Last week we were in the story of the ten lepers. We're going to return to that this week. And the question is today in this encounter with Jesus, what does it take to end up at the feet of Jesus? We're mindful that one of our ten lepers ends up at the feet of Jesus when nine others do not. And so we really want to ask the question, what does it take to end up at the feet of Jesus? So let's read again in Luke 17, beginning in verse 11. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have mercy, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves. It's very clear. Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Luke highlights Samaritans. He highlights outside faith. In Luke chapter 10, a Samaritan is the hero of what love really looks like in the story of the Good Samaritan. Now here, seven chapters later, a Samaritan again is a hero of the story. But not so much in what love looks like, but what real faith looks like. As we continue to read, Jesus asks, we're, we're not all... Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this, this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go, your faith has made you well. Last week, we got a lot out of this passage, and this week, because of God's good grace and His good word, we're going to get a lot out of this passage. And what really caused me to come back to this passage again, I don't think I've ever done this in 10 years of preaching here, is this question. This Samaritan is highlighted, and at one level, at a very big level, at a very clear level, the exemplar of our story is the guy who's been disobedient. Now, are you following me on this one? We've read it so many times that that doesn't even stick out to us. But you better believe those who first heard this story 
Those who first read about ten men saying, Jesus, Master, which implies you're the Master, you're the Lord, whatever you do, we're going to obey the Master. It's not going to be a suggestion. It's not going to be, well, if you have time, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. His directions aren't real difficult. Well, do this, A, B, C, but on a Tuesday you do something differently. No. Go show yourselves to the priests. Ten men go. One man returns. Nine men, the text kind of alludes, God's word kind of alludes to, nine men go ahead and follow Jesus' command. They go to the priest. This disobedient one, if you'll go along with me a little ways on this, This disobedient one, when you expect maybe him to come back, and if you were to read God's word the first time, you're waiting for almost a chastising. Didn't I tell you to go? Didn't you call me master? What are you doing back here? This doesn't even, we've read it so many times, this, this begins to strike us at odd to even ask these questions. But those people who first read this story, this gentleman did not go see the priest. He is back again. How is Jesus highlighting this one who disobeys Torah? Now, the Samaritans were good with the first five books, the law, the Torah, the books of Moses. This Samaritan would have understood Leviticus 13 and 14 of going to show yourself to a priest. So he's been disobedient to his Bible. He's been disobedient to Jesus. And yet when he returns... He's the one that's not chastised, but raised up in exaltation as an example for all of us to take note of. How could this be? What is Jesus doing in this story? And in this encounter with Jesus, what can we learn today that can bring about a real encounter with Him in our lives and for others this week? And I believe the question we need to ask this morning is this. Could it be that this one leper who returns in seeing the cleansing and seeing the healing that came to him as he was, as we talked about last week, obeying in the process as he went, he was healed, he was cleansed. Could it be that this leper gets, comprehends who the real priest really is? He wasn't disobedient. He understood who the real priest of the story was. Because Leviticus 14, in going to see the priest, it was not to receive a healing. You were just being recognized for the healing that had already been taken place so that sacrifices, so that thanksgivings could be offered in the presence of a priest. Could it be this morning in talking about sacrifice and thanksgiving and who the real priest is that our leper just doesn't get who the real priest is in Jesus but he gets far more. That this leper understands where salvation can be found. That this leper understands where sacrifice can be found. And because of those two things, where thanksgiving should be offered. Could it be that in Luke's telling of this, of his relaying of the gospel, that God's word is telling us through Luke that salvation and sacrifice and thanks always go to Jesus. Well, Mitch, I don't know. uh, This is a little bit of a stretch for me. And for many, you're going, no, no, I'm tracking with you, brother. But for the one that's saying, are we really sure that this leper and that Luke is relaying to us a story about Jesus being the real priest, about Jesus being the real source of sacrifice, about Jesus being the real place where we then come and lay our thanksgiving? Did you notice that the leper is healed? But then when Luke refers to the leper... He doesn't talk about healing. What is he talking about? He talks about cleansing. Go and be cleansed. And when the leper was cleansed. See, there's more going on in the story here. The primary thing that the leper is being blessed and receiving is not just a healing, but a much more of a cleansing. And when we we begin to read a cleansing language into this, then we see all the more salvation and priesthood and sacrifice, and where our true thanksgiving goes. This morning, let me ask this question. Where will you look this week for your salvation? 
Where will you look this week for your source of strength and renewed life? There are many in our nation right now who are coming unglued at the prospect that their candidate won't be the source of their salvation. Brothers and sisters, that is not the source of our salvation. Amen, church? And though we are blessed to be involved in the process, and though we are blessed to discern, and though we are blessed in James 1 and 5 to pray for wisdom, we are people who primarily understand that that is secondary to the fact that Jesus is our priest, He is our sacrifice, He is our thanksgiving, and this week, just like our one leper, we return to His feet and we give Him thanks and we understand He is the one that we are living for and that has lived for us. This morning on the back of your handout, there's a sermon outline. Our first point this morning, having said all this, is this. What does it take to end up at the feet of Jesus? Number one, it takes a discerned disobedience. See, to call someone master and savior is to call someone else not my master. To call something else no longer my master. You cannot serve two gods. And so we are a people who understand not only are we obedient to God, we are disobedient to old ways. We are disobedient to the world. We are people who are laying it all at the feet of Jesus. We are people who understand that with new revelations of His salvation, that it calls for new routines in our steps of daily living. If He is master and the world is not, then we will, as ten travel to old ways, if we understand Him to be our real Savior, we will alter course and return to Him and put our lives at His feet. So Mitch, what does that look like? In the 11th century, King Henry III of Bavaria grew very tired of court life and the pressures of being monarch. He made application to a local monastery, asking to be accepted as a contemplative and spend the rest of his life in the monastery. Your Majesty, said one of the monks, do you understand that the pledge here is one of obedience? That will be very hard for you because you have been king. I understand, said King Henry. The rest of my life I will be obedient to you as Christ leads you. To which the monk responded, Then I will tell you what to do. Go back to your throne and serve faithfully in the place where God has put you. When King Henry died, a statement was placed upon his tomb, the king learned to rule by being obedient. When we tire of our roles, when we tire of our responsibilities, when we grow weary and we want to alter course and throw off all pendings of him being master and do something new for him, it helps to remember God has planted us, planted me, planted you, in a certain place and told us to be a good accountant, a good teacher, a good mother, and a good father. Christ expects us to be faithful where He has put us, and when He returns, we will rule together with Him, thus saith the Lord. We are people who understand it takes a discerned disobedience to function in this life. I'm just going to go to my job and do my thing. I'm just going to show up in my, my regular role as mom and dad and do my thing. I'm going to show up as an accountant. I'm going to show up as a trash collector. I'm going to show up as a state official. I'm going to show up as this or that and do my thing. You're not called to do your thing. You're called to do his thing. You're called because you understand him as a source of your salvation to return to his feet and call him master. Let me even say this. Are you serving as a Christian the same way you were serving a year ago? Are you praying as a Christian the same way you were 10 years ago? Are you encouraging other Christians the same way you were 20 years ago? Are you sharing your faith the same way you were five years ago? 
It's time to not only be disobedient to the world's ways, it's time to be disobedient to your old ways as a Christian. Because with new revelations from God come new steps and new routines of walking in Him. I pray to God that I am not the Christian. If He does not come back or call me back, that I will not be the Christian in 2036 that I am in 2016. I am called to be disobedient to my old ways of growing in Him and grow in new ways in Him. So we're called to be people. Mitch, this thing you're talking about isn't a place that you live with Christ. It's a path that you're walking with Christ. Amen. We're talking about discipleship. We're talking about being a student. We're talking about being an ongoing learner. We're talking about being people that when we live this way, by the way, parents, this is when our faith is not just taught, but our faith is caught. Our kids, that's when it gets powerful. We teach faith, our children are taught faith, but when we're living in these new ways, our children are about the business of catching faith as well. It's not just taught, it's caught. Here's a picture of our Jinx branch this past Sunday. Go ahead and bring it up. That's baby JD. What is baby JD doing when church is over? He's stacking chairs. This is going to be scary in about 18 years, all right? <laughs> Go ahead and show the next picture. Dad's an offensive lineman, offensive lineman for Mississippi State. Baby JD, all right, pushing chairs. Where does baby JD get that? Because he sees big daddy JD's doing that. Our faith is not just taught, our faith is caught. It is time to be disobedient to, I think I'll head for lunch. I think I'll get out quick. Or I think I'll stay and serve. I think I'll still continue to be at the feet of the master. And my children are watching what I'm doing. Number two this morning, what does it take to end up at the feet of Jesus? It takes a decision to be different. What makes this leper really different than the other nine? There was nothing different about the mess they were in. They all had leprosy. There was nothing different about the miracle they had received. They had been cleansed. They had been healed. So if there's nothing different about the mess and there's nothing different about the miracle, God's Word is leading us to one other conclusion. There's something different about the man. And we begin to understand what does it take to end up at the feet of Jesus? It takes a decision to be different. And I am wondering this morning if the leper that is our exemplar example, if this was not his first time, I'm in fact betting on the fact that it wasn't his first time to be thankful. That this wasn't just a moment where he came through. But that thanksgiving, even in the circumstances he was in, was one of the mainsprings of his life. That this was not an occasion where he was thankful, but this leper had chosen an occupation of being thankful. I'm wondering if as the other lepers watched the sun go down, if they watched the sun go down, but the leper that is our example was giving praise to the Lord, if he was thankful for his meals, that when his eyesight was fading due to eyelids no longer batting because they were no longer sensitive and he's going blind and others were complaining, if our leper is not going, Lord God, thank you that I can still hear. Thank you for the birds. Mitch, I don't know if he could do that. You know of people in your life today that do that on both ends. Some take a little blow and all they do is complain. Some take a huge knock from life and they find a way to give thanksgiving to God. Have you encountered these people before? I'm wondering if this leper here was not one of these people. That a discarded robe, he could have complained that it wasn't new, but instead he was thankful to have it. In his leprosy, he was thankful that at least he had another nine to bond with in this horrible affliction. Someone says, Mitch, you can't know if he was thankful before or not. That's a neat supposition, but this I do know, church. We are called to give thanksgiving, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18, in all circumstances. James would say in chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, because you know they bring about a maturity in Christ where you will not be lacking anything. You know, I've never moonlighted in my 25 years here. If you're not, you know, young people, I've never had a second job 
in my 25 years here at Park Plaza, but this next week, I'm going to apply for another position. I've decided along with being a preacher, I want to be an astronaut, okay? Did you hear about Scott Kelly and the blessing he got from being in space for 340 days? I've decided it's time for my driver's license when it says that I'm six feet tall to no longer be a liar, okay? It doesn't say I'm six feet. I wish it did. It says I'm 5'10", and I think that's even a lie. Scott Kelly, if you haven't caught the news, 340 days with no gravity caught up in the zero G of space grew two inches. Sign me up for that. That's going to be my next job. I anticipate NASA will have me come down and see them tomorrow. But did you catch the other things that came along with growing? His skin is a mess. His bones are brittle. His heart is smaller. He has extreme muscle loss. He suffers from lack of balance. His isolation for the better part of a year has led to the equivalent of PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome. Let me say this, brothers and sisters. When we want a life with no gravity of problems, nothing pulling us down, man, we'll grow and be big. You may look big on the outside, but on the inside you're dying. It is the gravity and the circumstances, now catch this, some people get the gravity of circumstances and they just let it kill them. They still have a small heart. They still have brittle bones. But there are some that when the circumstances come and the gravity of affliction and suffering comes, they say 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18 is for me. I give thanks in all circumstances. And they may look small on the outside, but on the inside, huge hearts for God let us be people who understand that we are called to be those that come to the feet of Jesus and we give thanks in all circumstances Friday I fly out to do a youth rally in Loveland Colorado I don't know when they're gonna stop calling me for these things because they're wearing me out and I am up in Loveland Colorado watching kids with more energy do things and it's wearing me out just watching them and I thought that was as tired as I could get until the brethren up there put me in a hotel on the edge of Loveland headed towards Rocky Mountain National Park. And I am most assured that it is the only hotel motel in Colorado where people who occupy it can keep their dogs because everyone save me had a large dog. I'm not talking poodles. I'm not talking Fifi. I, I am talking massive Colorado Iditarod Husky dogs, okay? You go, Mitch, what does this have to do with the youth rally and being tired? At 2 a.m., one dog decided, I'm going to howl at the moon. I don't know if you're aware of what happens to other dogs when one dog howls at the moon. I woke up at 2 a.m. and I said, what is this noise? This is not good surround sound dogs barking and my spirit began to go I am not giving Thanksgiving in all circumstances I'm pretty upset right now and I'm gonna go begin to knock on doors get your dog quiet now I began to think the Apostle Paul was with me <laughs> Mitch really you're in a hotel some church that flew you up here you know how long it would have taken me to walk from Tulsa to Denver? Really, Mitch? This is what you're going to complain about? Oh, they're going to beat you tomorrow at the youth rally? No, they're not going to beat me. They, they probably pay for my lunch. Paul's going, really? Brothers and sisters, a real point on this. We need to understand that most of our gravity, oh, Mitch, I got gravity bringing me down. It's not real gravity. It's what we call circumstances of suffering. But Paul and those in the first century would be going, really? Really? Dogs barking in a motel, Mitch? This, this is it for you? I'm carrying my cross. <laughs> really? Let us be people who put it in perspective. Let, let me also say this. There are times when, you know, as soon as I'm done here, I, I've got to drive out to Jinx or Brookside. Then I've got to drive back here. Sometimes I miss sitting with my family in church. And sometimes what we're doing here with the branches, I begin to, it's hard, it's hard. I show up at that youth rally on Friday. 
and those vans pull in to Loveland, Colorado. Saw one from Trinidad, and I saw one from Gillette, Wyoming. That's 543 miles. They had 130 kids there. And those kids said, we have never seen so many Christians. And I began to think to myself, what I choose to complain about, we got too many people, this is hard. Those people are going, what we wouldn't give. You've got more Christians in your church. One guy said about Wyoming, he goes, in our city of Gillette, and then he went, or is it our state? Brothers and sisters, let us realize what real gravity is. And let that be a part of us deciding to be different. Let me also say number three this morning. It takes a defiant dependence. Did you notice our leper comes back with a loud voice? This past Monday, I was struggling to come to the Lord with a, fat, a loud voice. I saw the movie War Room, and it changed my life. I still don't have a war room, but I do have a war book. And I don't hold this up for you to lift myself up at all, but as a poor man of prayer for years that the Lord has finally broken through to, and this is a big part of it. And in my war book are listed the many prayers that I pray over every morning. On my first page, the first three lines say this, Thank you, thank you, thank you, because I know me, and I will show up tomorrow morning for my prayer time, and it'll begin, Lord, give me this, Lord, give me that, Lord, be with them, Lord, do this. And before I do any of that, I need to be like that one leopard. Lord, thank you. Lord, thank you. Lord, thank you. And this past Monday morning, those thank yous were coming, they were coming with no heart at all. It was the most mechanical, laborious, thing that I'd ever gone through. And so I turned to Psalms 100 that talks about... If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Psalm 100. Psalm 100, when you begin your prayers and the thank yous are not rolling out of your heart and off your lips, perhaps like they should, Psalm 100 helps with this. <coughs> A psalm for giving thanks. Remember that in your Old Testament... That little header part, it's not like your New Testament where someone has added a story about the ten lepers. This is actually scripture. In the Jewish Bibles, that little header, a psalm of giving thanks, that's verse 1. And what we call verse 1, shout for joy, that's their verse 2. And so the great thing about Psalm 100 is when you're struggling with giving thanks, the best way to give words to God is give God his own words back. And let him teach us. And so, a psalm for giving thanks starts like this. Shout for joy to the Lord. Did you already do what my mind has been doing for the past two decades? Changing the preposition? Shout with joy. That's my problem, God. I'm struggling with thanksgiving this morning. I'm struggling with joy this morning. I don't have any joy to give to you. Well, Mitch, that's because you changed the preposition. When you can't shout with joy, you come to me and you shout for joy. God, I'm having trouble giving you thanks. I'm having trouble getting to a place of joy. And so, Father, I don't come today shouting with joy. I come today shouting for joy, Lord. And I come to you, the one who gives it. And, Father, I just don't come and say, Father, I ask, I request, I kind of raise my... I shout for joy. You've been asked many times in your spiritual life, where's your quiet place? This morning, let me ask you another question. Where's your shouting place? Where's your place where you get defiant in your dependence upon God? You shout for joy. God, give me joy, and I come to you, not old sources of salvation. But at your feet, I shout for joy. Now, notice what the Lord does here. He continues to teach us how to ask and receive thanks and joy worship he's giving commands now he's the master worship the lord with gladness come before him with joyful songs know the lord is god enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise 
Give thanks to Him and praise His name. These are not suggestions. These are directives from the Lord. Come before me. Worship me. Enter before me. Know that I'm the Lord. Give me thanks. Shout, request, ask loudly for joy from me. Let me ask this question this morning. In being one who is defiant in your dependence upon Him, are you listening to yourself every morning, every Monday morning? Or are you talking to yourself? There's a big difference there. Monday morning, I don't have much Thanksgiving. You're listening to yourself. Or are you allow God's scripture to enter your heart and now you're talking to yourself? You're allowing his word to lead you. Let me end with this this morning. Luke is not done in his gospel of those being defiant in their dependence. Luke is not done with those deciding to be different. Luke is not done with those who will discern a disobedience to this world. Luke 23 and 46 says this, if this was ever a defiant dependence, this is it. Jesus called out. You talk about a dirty leper that needed to be cleansed. At this moment, he has the sins of the world upon him. He is the most filthy that has ever been. What do you do in that situation? Jesus called out with a loud voice, not God, not Lord of hosts, Abba, Daddy, well, what dependence? Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. That's defiant dependence. Today, have you defied this world? Today, are you going to decide to be different? Today, are you going to come into His presence, fall at His feet, as Jesus did with His Father, and say, this changes the whole thing of Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. This isn't quiet resignation. This is loud thanksgiving. This was Jesus' best Father today. So I've always pictured it like this. Loud voice. Father today. I commit to you my spirit. He's that leper. Father, today, I commit to you, the one I know who I can really depend on, my spirit. Will you also take that step today? Will you come before him and give him your life in baptism? Will you come and give him your life again by confessing sin and being done with old ways and returning to his feet? Will you come now as we stand together and as we sing?